David, so far we've traced out a whole lot of different strings, threads in, in Mark's gospel. One of the chief ones is this ongoing question of who Jesus is. Yes. And we get to a kind of signature posing of that question in chapter 8. What do you think is going on as, as Jesus turns to the disciples and asks this first question? I'm, I'm of two minds on that, and I'll give them both to you. The, the, what Jesus asks is, first of all, who do people say that I am? And then they give a list, Elijah, John the Baptist rev revived one of the prophets. And then he says to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter picks it up and says, you're the Christ. The standard answer, which most days I believe, <clears throat> is that this is Jesus testing them to see how far their faith has come. And we have certainly been concerned all the way along with saying, are the disciples getting it or are they not getting it? And on that assumption, Jesus knows the right answer and is simply checking with the disciples to see how well they're doing with it. The, the more out there line is that, that we read Mark's gospel as if it were all decided from the beginning, but that in fact, if you read Mark, there's a kind of progression in what Jesus says about himself too. Mm -hmm. And that this may be uh, the moment at which Jesus is firming up in his own ministry who he's supposed to be. And so he asks about people, and then he asks about the disciples, not just for their sake, but for his sake as well. I'm, I'm torn on that. I find the second one in some ways more appealing as drama. Mm -hmm. The first one probably more plausible as exegesis, as reading of the text. Mm -hmm. But I think what's, what's not in dispute um, is that Peter gives an answer which, which Jesus receives oddly ambivalently. Um, Matthew, I believe, and I, I know you do too, used Mark's gospel and then in, reinterprets it for his own time. Right. And at, at just the same point in Matthew's gospel, uh, Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Uh, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father, you're the rock on this rock I build my church. Right. Mazel tov, beautifully done, hooray. Yeah. Peter, once again, you've got it. Yeah. Uh, and in Mark's gospel, Jesus just doesn't say a mumbling word. It says, you are the Christ. And then Jesus, in some ways, seems to shift the topic and says, the Son of Man, which is another title for himself, is going to have to suffer many things. Peter doesn't say, thank you very much for clarifying who you are, Lord and Savior. He says, God forbid, Jesus, don't do that. He rebukes him. And now Jesus turns and rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, you Satan. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a, there is within the text of Mark, I think, a tension about, one, who Jesus is, and two, what it means to say who Jesus is. And Mark wants to say from 1-1 one, one on that Jesus is the Messiah, but I think from 1-1 one, one on, and certainly here he's saying, not the Messiah you were all expecting, right. and certainly not the Messiah that you, Peter, were expecting. And, and the way I read the text, and I'm, I'm, I'd love your help with this, the way I read the text is that, that, that Jesus qualifies what Peter says because at some level, Jesus knows that what Peter means by that is not sufficient meaning. Right. That, that what it means for Jesus to be Messiah is one who will suffer for us and will suffer as God's representative. And when Peter says, you're the Messiah, he means Jesus Christ, superstar. You're, you're on your way, triumph, glory, yep. power. And Jesus answers that by saying, let me, let me reframe the thing. Let's not even talk Messiah language. Let's talk son of man language. Let's talk suffering language. I'm not exactly the Messiah you want me to be. And then, and then I think Peter rebukes him for two reasons, and, and this will lead to some things we're going to be concerned about, I think, later in our discussion. He rebukes him partly because he doesn't want this to happen to Jesus. That he, he, uh, whoever Peter right. is, there's no question he loves Jesus in right. this gospel. He may misunderstand him. He will soon enough deny him. He will, alas, desert him. But he loves him. I think that, that's never up for question in this gospel. And if you said to me, all right, day after tomorrow, here's the bad news, I'm going to die, I would not be pleased, right, right? Uh, because of my loyalty to you. And that's part of what's going on here. But if you said to me the following, uh, the day after tomorrow, I'm pretty sure that those who are engaged in the Yale Bible study will be executed starting with me, mm -hmm. I would be doubly displeased. <laughs> displeased, first of all, because there you go, yeah. and second of all, because there I go. Exactly. Yeah. And I think at some level, Peter says, all right, this is the guy we're following. If he's saying, here's my destiny, my destiny is I will be persecuted, I will suffer many things, and I will die. Peter says, well, if that's the deal for you, what's the deal for me? And the God forbid becomes, 
I don't want that to happen to you, and I don't want that to happen to me. Now, uh, I'd love your response on that. Then I want to come back to the Satan thing in a minute. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> it occurs to me we haven't talked yet about the way these different titles work right. together. Right? right. We saw Son of God in chapter one yeah. twice, twice. And, and then we've seen uh, Messiah here. We've seen Son of Man here. Yeah. And it, it has always seemed to me that, that this author has to use the materials that are available to him, right. almost like the he, palette that's on his... He doesn't come up with new, he, new names for Jesus. But he moves them, he as does you're move saying. Them. That, that the, the metaphor I th think of is he's got certain paints on his palette, yeah. and he uses those, but he blends them and brings them together differently yeah. than has been done. Uh, in, in other Gospels, uh, in Matthew... Uh, we we see that done a little bit through John the Baptist when uh, John the Baptist asks, "Are you are you the one who is to come, or right. shall we keep on looking?" Right. Uh, because the expectation has been not exactly met, right? Exactly. In in, in right. this gospel, we get it in this episode. Exactly. And the way the the disciples don't understand. Yeah. So, so yes, I I think that's a uh, it's a good sort of pairing to look at both the way the titles are brought together and to look at what are the motivations for Peter's opposition, yeah, right? Okay, I, I yeah. think um, th Jesus comes back then, of course, with uh, if anyone wishes to follow me, if yeah. anyone wishes to come yeah. after me, let him deny himself, yeah. take up his cross and follow me, which gets to one of Peter's two It gets to one right? of Peter's, and, 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 and I suspect Peter sees that one coming. I mean, in a yeah. way, Jesus says, I know what... Yeah. In a way, he's saying, I know what you're worried about, and by God, you're you right to be, be worried. Yeah. That is the deal, Peter, right. right? That if you follow me, you're going to, you too, this is not just my cross, this is your cross. The, on the Satan thing, and then I wanted to pick up the cross thing again. When Jesus turns to him and says, get behind me, you Satan, um, for years I thought that was just a kind of useful put down, right. you know, you dummy, right. or you unfaithful person, or you about to deny me guy. But Satan, in, in the world in which they lived, and in, indeed in the world of the other Gospels, Satan is not just the person who's wrong. Satan's the one who sets up the temptation, mm -hmm. sets up the test. Right. And my suspicion is, as I read Mark more and more often, that when Jesus says to him, get behind me, you Satan, that's to signal to us, who are careful readers or hearers, that that's a real temptation for Jesus. Right. In Mark's Gospel, right. we don't have the temptation in the wilderness. Right. Um, but in many ways, the temptation in the wilderness in Matthew and Luke does the same thing. Yeah. Give this all up, come home, don't worry about this, don't worry about your power, it's just going to get you in trouble. Right. Peter becomes, becomes Satan for that moment in this text, and he puts out the test for Jesus, and Jesus passes it by saying, get behind me, get away from me, but I think it's a real temptation. And I think it's picked up in the garden. And it's picked up in the garden. Right? When... when Jesus says, can we do this any other way? Yeah, right? exactly. If it is possible, let this cup pass from yeah. me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He's re-answering exactly. this temptation. Exactly, right? exactly. Uh, and, and when Nikos Katsanzakis writes his book called The Last Temptation of Christ, right. it's highly imaginative and highly original, but it really picks up on a theme that really is there in the Gospels, which is right. the time after time, the biggest test for Jesus is to back down. Yeah. That, that, and then he, Katsanzakis has him, marrying Mary Magdalene and all that. We don't get any of that. But we do get that idea that why don't we just go home? Yeah. Why don't we just back down? Why don't we not suffer all these things? Yeah. And for the first time in the book here, really, we're getting mm -hmm. the shape of what it is to follow Jesus. And we are. Right? We've had uh, seven chapters of fantastic happenings and some conflicts and ways that Jesus has thrown data out there as to who he is. We then get this quick run on who he actually is and a turn to what it is to follow him. Yep. Um, that's going to be coming up for a while. It's going to be huge. Too, right? it's, going it's, going to, it's going to keep happening and in those, in those passages after what comes immediately after the, the scene we just set, which is the transfiguration. He takes three with him yep. right? and he says follow and, yep. and come up. Yep. Uh, talk to me about the transfiguration. The transfiguration is in some ways uh, for me, one of the two most puzzling texts in, in Mark's Gospel, the other one being chapter 13 that we'll talk about soon. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, to be sure in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is extraordinary and performed extraordinary miracles and the Spirit comes down upon him. But he's transfigured in the transfiguration, right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 just to be extremely naive about it, I suspect you know, that the, the general radiance quality of Jesus <laughs> up until chapter 9 was he was about as radiant as you are now, which is not bad, but not stunning, right? I mean, I don't say, whoo, 
<laughs> Alan, um, when you get to the Transfiguration, the disciples say, "Woo, Jesus!" Yeah. Because there he is, shining brightly, right. uh, absolutely glorious, and chatting with Moses and Elijah, who are these two great figures. Uh, I, we need to pause, I think, on Moses and Elijah. I've read, I've read different readings of this, but the simplest, and I think to me the most helpful still, is that, that one way that Jewish people talked about their scripture was to say it's the law and the prophets. Right. Yeah, right. And, and the law is obviously Moses. And for Judaism, the great prophet was always Elijah. He was the exemplary prophet. Right. So in some ways what you have is, jo is Jesus talking with the law and the prophets as at minimally an equal. So here are these disciples who've been trying to figure out who is this guy, is he the Messiah? Next big moment is, whoa, not only is he sort of the Messiah and sort of the Son of Man, he is suddenly chatting with Elijah and Moses, mm -hmm. which is, you know, he, he goes to Mount Rushmore. Right. Do not pass go, go right. straight to Mount Rushmore. Yeah. And, and, and then, astonishingly, at the next move in the story, and God basically says, okay, now stop paying any attention to Moses and Elijah, this is my son. Yeah. This is the one I want you to hear. This is the really big boy. I, I just have no idea what the Newsweek or Time magazine photographer would have seen if there had been one there. Yeah. Theologically, I think, what Mark is saying at this point is, is to kind of take, is to take what, what uh, Peter says and go even farther. To say, oh, the Christ thing is good enough. We can beat that. Right. This is not even just Messiah. This is not even just king like David. This is, says God, my own son, so important that when you've got him plus the law plus the prophets, he's more important than either the law or the prophets. Right. Listen to him. Right, right. And, you know, the, the radiance issue, there's that great scene in Life of Brian where uh, the, the wise men come from afar and they come to Brian's house as he's a newborn yeah. and his mom is rude and they come in and they can't figure out quite what's going on but they're here to give gifts to the babe and they, they lay the gifts at the feet of this child and they go out and in the next house over is this bright light, <laughs> right? right? And yeah. then they come back yeah. in and they yeah, get yeah. the gifts and they take yeah, them over. Yeah, to, yeah. It would be so much easier if it were just it radiance just, all the time. Had radiance all the time. But the radiance now, I think, has a purpose because what he's just said is this is a lot different than you thought. That's right. right? He's just said this Messiah is a dying one and so are you yeah. dying followers. Yeah. And so maybe the, the premium on getting an audience here from the disciples is the highest it gets in the book. Nice. Right? Yeah, nice. That, so we need, we need a highlighter pen. We need a highlighter. Uh, so yeah. a divine highlighter pen. Yeah. So God gives them the highlighter pen, and he says, even, uh, even against the things that made you expect otherwise, yeah. listen to this guy. Listen to this guy. Right. Jesus also says after this that they're not, or Mark says, they won't get this till after the resurrection. Right. And I think in what, part of what Mark is saying to us as believers is that the fullness of who Jesus is as Son of God is revealed not just through his ministry, not even through his crucifixion alone, right. revealed right. in both of those, but not exclusively. Finally, in the resurrected Christ, we begin to see that this is not only Messiah, not only Son of Man, uh, but God's own Son. And they will not get it till they see And they will yeah, not get that, it till right. that point. I want to circle back for a minute to, to um, the line he gives to Peter on, on to Peter and the rest of the disciples, and then picks up again later in this, in this central chapter, central chapters of the gospel, where he talks about taking up our own cross and being servants. Right. Uh, so often in our kind of um, pop chat about things, I'll say like, well, I've got to grade 35 papers this week, that's just my cross to bear. Right. Right? Right, right. Which is just heart-rending. I mean, right. you write, <laughs> go home to my comfortable home, and after a good dinner, <laughs> I sit down with nice music on the CD player yeah. and grade papers, and right. by God, that's my cross to yeah. bear. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he doesn't mean grade 35 papers or cut back on your, on right. your cholesterol for the next two weeks. Um, or put up with it, your difficult in-laws for the holidays. Those are not the crosses we bear. Those are just annoyances. Right. Um, he's, he is speaking to a world where to follow Jesus is to take on the risk of losing everything for his sake and yeah. for the sake of the gospel. Yeah. And so that when, when Peter hears that word, take up your cross and follow me, he doesn't think, oh, darn, it's going to be a hard week. He thinks this may be everything. This, yeah. may, this may be the cost of discipleship. Right. And so Bonhoeffer may be the place to end. Jesus bids us to come and die. Yeah, right? exactly. That's our time. Thank you.